warm welcome to TV Africa News and thank you for always joining us. This is Africa Today. My name is Najima Luima. But first are the headlines. Minister Jojo Odong receives credentials from four new envoys. Government automates more hospitals to help improve management. South African indigenous king arrested for growing weed at the presidency. And in sports, Ivory Coast lead Group E after beating Equatorial Guinea 1-0. I will welcome once again now the news in detail. Four newly accredited envoys to Uganda from Cuba, South Korea, Democratic Republic of Algeria, and the regional hub manager of the Islamic Development Bank have presented their credential letters to the Foreign Affairs Minister, General J.J. Odong. The minister welcomed the respective envoys and commended each of them on the existing excellent cordial bilateral relations with the Republic of Uganda. We have more. Upon presentation of her letter of credence, the Cuban ambassador designated to Mrs. Tania Perez Kiefs reiterated the importance of the historical bilateral relations between Uganda and Cuba that she said is premised on common values and mutual understanding in promoting development, especially through cooperation. Perez assured the Ugandan Minister of her efforts to enhance the already strong relations between Uganda and Cuba, but also expressed her anticipation for the non-aligned movement summit to be hosted in Uganda and looks forward to Cuba's participation. On the other side, Dr. Isaac Umal Idrisu, the regional hub manager of the Islamic Development Bank, expressed his appreciation for the hospitality accorded by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Dr. Isaac emphasized the bank's commitment to human resource development as a key area of support aside from the many development projects in Uganda. Meanwhile, Sharif Khalid, the ambassador designate of the People's Democratic Republic of Algeria, conveyed his appreciation for the strong cordial relations between Uganda and Algeria, but also noted he is looking forward to deepening bilateral relations between both countries. Park Sang So, the ambassador designate of the Republic of Korea, commended the minister on the hospitality and friendly nature of Ugandans. He highlighted the relevance of this year as it marks the 60th anniversary of diplomatic relations between the Republic of Korea and the Republic of Uganda and emphasized the need to strengthen bilateral cooperation between both countries. Minister General J.J. Odong assured the envoys of the full support of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in execution of their duties as well as wishing them productive tours of duty in Uganda. State Minister for Primary Education Joyce Moriku Kadichi has issued a strong warning to schools that have increased the school fees from fees structures that were charging before the closure of schools in March 2020 that they risk facing disciplinary action. This has been revealed as the Ministry of Education in partnership with the Save the Children International launch the national back to school campaign aimed at ensuring that all children return back to school without fail. Reports. Teachers are also required to help learners catch up on the lost time, support vulnerable children to return and stay in school, report any suspected cases of students with symptoms of COVID-19 to the nearest facility, and provide counseling to students to help them resume school life. One is to write a warning letter for the head teacher. That already goes to your record as a civil servant. It is bad. Two, you can be transferred from a school where you think you have powers to another school where we see that you exert that power. Three, you can be interdicted. It's not a simple matter. These are all options of disciplinary measures that we will take if the head teachers 
have failed to adhere to the set guidelines. We therefore call upon all our parents, all our caregivers, all our guidance, guidance, to safely take all the children back to school. And together, let us work towards preventing future learning interruptions. Let us all aim at sustainability of the schools as they reopen. When you get home from school today, or tomorrow, or next week, tell your parents about your lessons and what you have learned. Most of all, have fun, wear a mask, respect and listen to your teacher, and finally, tell your teacher and parents, thank you for helping you go back to school. Nalugo Muyingo, Africa Today. In a move aimed at improving public health facility efficiency, government has installed the Integrated Health Management Information System, an IT-based management system, to more hospitals around the country. Kachanchu has more. Itojo General Hospital in Intungam, Buera General Hospital in Kasese and Iganga General Hospital have been the latest hospitals to which the Ministry of Health has handed over the system to integrated intelligent computer system technologies and ready for deployment. Once deployed, it brings the total to 13 health facilities that the system will be operational in the country. Voiced by the Presidential Support to Scientists Initiatives and superintended by Uganda National Council of Science and Technology, the Integrated Health Management Information System is aimed at automating and improving service delivery. Before rolling out of the system, research findings led to the innovation of an IT-based system pharmaceuticals and medical supplies management system, which in 2010 was piloted at Mulago National Referral Hospital. The process of ordering, approving, sanctioning, picking, issuing shelving of medicine were automated, leading in the reduction of drug expiry from the astronomical 148 million shillings per month to about 127,000 per month. Impressed by the constructive undertakings of the installation, government through the Ministry of Health engaged the agency to further roll out the IHMIS in all government hospitals, including referrals, general hospitals, and all health centers within a period of four years. Analysts observe that the IHMIS is a game changer and a timely innovation in the wake of unwarranted drug expiration and uncounted for medicinal shortages at public health centers. Let's take a quick break. We will be right back. Welcome back, you're still watching TV African News, The Right to Know. South African police on Wednesday approached a cannabis garden grown by indignant Khoisan activists outside President Cyril Ramaphosa's office for over three years. Police arrested a Khoisan leader who clinged to a shoulder hide cannabis plant as they dragged it across the presidential lawn in Pretoria. The Khoisan leader, wearing a traditional loincloth, clung to a shoulder height plant as police dragged it across the presidential lawn in Pretoria before arresting him. The Khoisan were formerly known as Bushmen or Hotendots, a name coined by Dutch settlers in the 17th century, reflecting the clique's characteristic of their languages. The group's tarpaulin tents have been a fixture on the emerald lawns of the South African president's office since 2018, when they began a campaign for official recognition of their languages. One of the tents is just meters away from a giant bronze statue of Nelson Mandela, the country's first black president. Around two dozen police, some in riot gear, others mounted on horseback, and some with sniffer dogs raided the small group. Police did not respond to the media's request for comment, 
but journalists had officers on the scene saying the raid was over the cannabis planted some six months ago in the activists' vegetable garden. In 2018, South Africa's top court decriminalized the private and personal use of cannabis in a landmark case that pitted law enforcement agencies against advocates of the plant known locally as Daga. South Africa's Khoisan community is thought to number in the hundreds of thousands. Moving on, the United States Mint on Monday launched its American Women Quotas program, a four-year initiative to honor the work and accomplishments of various American women by placing their images on new quotas being launched from 2022 to 2025. To mark the program's start, the Mint released quotas bearing the likeness of writer, performer and activist Maya Angelou. Best known for her 1969 memoir, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings, Angelou is depicted on the coin with her arms outstretched in front of a rising sun and a bird in flight. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen said that each time they redesign their currency, they have the chance to say something about their country, what they value and how they have progressed as a society. Mint Deputy Director Ventris Gibson said that Maya Angelou used words to inspire and uplift. U.S. Mint Artistic Infusion Program artist Emily Damstra created the design, while the Mint is metallic artist Craig A. Campbell sculpted it. According to the press release, the artists were inspired by Angelou's poetry and the way she laid her life. The quota bearing Angelou's likeness is one of five new coins being released this year, each featuring the image of a prominent woman who has contributed to a variety of professions and institutions. Additional honors include Sari Ride, the physicist and educator made history on June 18, 1983, when she entered a space of the Shuttle Challenger following NASA's policy change to allow women in space in the late 1970s. When the Challenger exploded in 1986, she was one of the top investigators examining the incident. The Mint originally announced Angelo Andride as the program's first Honels in April 2021. They later revealed three additional Honels last June, Wilma Mankila, Adelina Otero Warren, and Anna May Wong. Mankila was the first woman elected as principal chief of the Cherokee Nation. She had dedicated her life to fighting for the rights of indigenous people in the U.S., her quota depicts her dressed in traditional clothing alongside the Cherokee Nation seven-pointed star. Egyptian President Abdul Fattah el-Sisi on Tuesday criticized the European government's handling of the migration issue. El-Sisi said Egypt was hosting six million people who escaped conflict and poverty in their own country. LCC made the remarks during a session at the World Youth Forum, which is taking place at the Red Sea Resort of Sham El Sheikh. He said that they didn't reject them or put them in camps, but rather was talking about huge numbers, not 5,000 or 10,000, whom their friends in Europe refused to receive. The United Nations International Organization for Migration says Egypt hosts more than 6 million migrants, more than half of them from Sudan and South Sudan, where simmering conflicts continue to displace tens of thousands of people annually. For some, Egypt is a destination and a haven, the closest and easiest country for them to enter. For others, it is a point of transit before attempting the dangerous Mediterranean crossing to Europe. Libya has emerged as the dominant transit point for migrants fleeing war and poverty in Africa, the Middle East hoping for a better life in Europe. Oil-rich Libya plunged into chaos after the 2011 NATO-backed uprising hosted and killed longtime dictator Muammar Gaddafi. Egypt has for decades been a refugee for sub-Saharan African migrants trying to escape war or poverty. Away from that, South African President Cyril Ramaphosa on Tuesday said there had been significant progress in tackling a militant insurgency in northern Mozambique after a multinational force deployed there last year. 
Ramaphosa, who chairs the Defense and Security Section of the Southern African Development Bloc, gave the updates during his opening remarks at the two days talk in the Malawian capital and called to assess developments in the region. Sadiq members and Rwanda stepped in six months ago to assist the beleaguered Mozambican army, bringing in more than 3,000 troops. Ramaphosa said that the security situation in Cabo Delgado is improving, which has allowed for some internally displaced persons to return to their homes and resume their normal lives. Operating alongside Mozambican troops, regional forces have helped to create safe passage for bringing humanitarian aid into jihadist hit areas, he said. The SADC mission in Mozambique was initially deployed in July, but its mandate was extended indefinitely in October. Cabo Delgado, a gas-rich province bordering Tanzania, has been gripped by Islamic State-linked militants since 2017. At least 3,500 people have died and around 820,000 have fled their homes. Atrocities include massacres, beheadings, the torching of homes and mass abductions, especially of girls. Let's once again take a quick break. We will be right back. Welcome back. You're still watching TV African News, the right to know. In our business news today, a bus station in Mali's capital stands unusually quiet with foreign passengers left in limbo after West African countries closed their borders with the military ruled nation. Africa Tours Trans is one of the main bus farms in the impoverished Sahel state, offering connections to its regional cities as well as to neighboring countries. On Sunday, the Economic Community of West African States agreed to shatter borders with Mali and impose a trade embargo over delayed elections. The move came after Mali's army-dominated government last month proposed staying in power for up to five years before restoring democracy despite international demands that it respect a promise to hold elections on February 27th. Dozens of would-be passengers were hanging around next to their luggage, left in limbo by recent border closures. Relations between Mali and its neighbors have steadily deteriorated since Colonel Asimi Goita took power in a military coup in August 2020. The sanctions are already affecting travelers in Mali, a vast landlocked nation of 19 million people that borders seven other states. The country's location makes it a key transport hub for the region, with Bamako a key stop along the land route, linking countries such as Senegal to states further east, such as Nigeria. Jennifer Edong, a Nigerian in her 30s who works in fashion, was among the passengers stranded at the Africa Tours Trans Station in Bamako. She had been traveling to the Gambia for work and had arrived in Mali on Friday, expecting her next connection to depart on Tuesday, only to turn up at the station and find the connection cancelled. Only the routes to Mauritania and Algeria, which are not ECOWAS members and Guinea, remain open. In our health news today, on Wednesday, South African pupils were back to the classroom for their first day of the 2022 academic year. In a country severely hit by the pandemic, Face masks, physical distancing, or rotational timetabling have become the new normal for the students. If protocols to prevent the spread of the virus are in place in many South African schools, St. Andrew's Private School is investigating mandatory vaccination for tours and experiential settings. In order to prevent the spread of the virus, the St. Andrew's Girls Only Private School has put in place protocols. The measures have helped staffing and learners to go back to a nearly ordinary everyday life according to the Senior School COVID Protocols Coordinator. 
On Monday, January 10th, the Department of Health and Basic Education made to consider a vaccination plan for eligible people, both adults and learners, since South Africans aged 12 and above can receive the job. At the Johannesburg St. Andrews School, vaccination is already available for students on a voluntary basis, but the management says the possibility of a vaccine mandate is being investigated for a certain school activities. Two years into the COVID outbreak, the schooling sector in South Africa has suffered from the loss of teaching and learning time as well as from educational personnel losing their lives to COVID-19 complications. In our sports news today, Max Grado's beautiful strike was enough to give the Elephant of Ivory Coast the win in their first game of the AFCON 2021 against Equatorial Guinea. Kachanchi has more. The Elephants, who were perfectly organized by their French coach Patrice Bumeli, began their campaign with a nice goal by Max Alain Grado, the former player of Toulouse and Saint Etienne. The powerful shot came from the right at the very beginning of the game after the Guinean defense lost the ball at the beginning of the game. Winners of the Chan in 2015, the Ivorians were deprived of their number one goalkeeper, Sylvain Giboho, who tested positive for COVID-19, but could count on a trio of high-end attacks. This victory is not convincing, but it's crucial for Côte d'Ivoire in this Group E, of which it takes the lead. It will meet in its third match against Algeria, which had drawn on Tuesday with Sierra Leone. That was the news. Thank you for always keeping it TV Africa. Please stay tuned to more programming coming your way.